righty. Hello, everybody. I think we'll go ahead and get started to uh, be respectful of everybody's time. Whoops. Whoa, I hope you wanted that. All right, let's see. You're unmuted. <laughs> All right, here we go. I'm Karen Hoskin, the Executive Director of the Co-Housing Association, and I'm super happy to be able to offer um, this series of web chats, Co-Housing and the Coronavirus. It uh, occurred to us, I think it was on the 10th of March, that um, all of a sudden people were kind of spinning a little bit with uh, changes and what was happening in the world and in the US. And um, we felt like it was important to be able to draw together our larger community of communities um, to basically remember that we have this relationship and whether I've actually met you as an individual or not, we have this commonality of living in community. And so being able to share experiences of living in co-housing right now during this coronavirus crisis. We should make that into one word, corona, coronavirus crisis. Um, and uh, just be able to draw on each other's experiences and strengths seemed really important. Um, so this series of web chats, uh, some of them are structured more like a discussion. So it's really here's the focus and what all have you experienced or what questions might you have or are you wondering of other communities? Uh, we also have a few of the web chats in this particular series where it's uh, structured more like, here's somebody presenting some information and now here's a Q&A section where we can also share ideas and thoughts and experiences. So, um, tonight's web chat topic, um, it's, this is formed much more like a discussion um, to be able to share experiences. And what has come up from a few people is those that are in a forming community or a building community somewhere in that creation stage, how, how can you attract new members to your community when you can't touch each other, <laughs> shake hands, <laughs> or even elbow bump these days. Um, and, and if you have some people that are eh, kind of on the fence, like they're still learning about your community, but they haven't like, you know, signed on the dotted line kind of thing, how can you engage them in the community? Um, or those communities that, that have a solid membership, but y'all aren't living together yet. Um, maybe not even in the same region. You might be spread out over the U.S. And how, how can you start to build those co-housing relationships? So I definitely am seeing a, a few names out there and recognize that some are from um, some communities that are exactly in those situations, forming, building, um, or just trying to trying to connect. So I would like to just kind of open it up. Y'all enter this room muted so that we don't have all kinds of craziness in the background. Um, but I think we have a group sizable, manageable enough for people to unmute and say something and then mute themselves. We'll give that a go. And if not, then I'll control it more. But I'd like y'all to have your own control. So, <laughs> so I guess the question is, is for communities that are forming building, what are some ways that you are continuing to engage newcomers um, or attract newcomers in this time where we're all like cloistered to our homes? I'd be happy to share an experience or perspective. Wonderful. Yeah, hi, I'm Dan Cruz. I live at uh, Stone Curves Co-Housing in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, I am by no means in a forming community. I've lived in this community for 15 years. And I guess the thing that I would say is that 
when we were forming our community, the, the momentum, the energy, the creativity to keep it moving forward was just unstoppable. It was just a magnificent experience. So my guess is that in the presence of this crazy situation we're going through, that energy is there um, and people are going to want to move ahead with creating community, creating co-housing. It's just a matter of finding ways to get around this crazy situation we're in to let that energy keep moving forward because it was, like I said, when I was involved, it was an unstoppable thing. The more people we got, the more energy we had, the more we wanted to move ahead. So I wouldn't see this uh, coronavirus thing as a, uh, as, as, as a, as a, uh, uh, absolute impediment to that by any means. I think there are, as we're demonstrating right now by getting together in this form, there are ways to channel that energy into moving ahead with community. So I hope that, uh, and also I, I should also mention that I'm a recently, uh, became a board member of the co-housing association and I'm here today specifically to take notes on this meeting and then watch the recording and do the same in order to distribute whatever wisdom we uh, comes out of this to the wider co-housing community across the country. Good to be Thank here. Thank you for doing that, Dan. You bet. So, is there anybody that feels like they've been experiencing some challenges already? Um, Karen? Hi. Hi, this is Roger in Berkeley. Hi. Um, I, I, I want to, um, Dan's, Dan's comment um, made me think of something that, uh, to, that, that I should share. Um, so we're, we're, uh, we have a new community forming in Berkeley. It's called Berkeley Moshav. And um, we have a lot of interest. We have an explorer, very, uh, a very um, low commitment level of membership. And we've got a, a whole lot of people. It's called Explorers. And we've got a whole lot of people in that group. We had a Zoom call on Sunday evening and 40 households joined 40 of those you know that like we had a very large number of households and it had been a previously planned zoom call anyway because we have a lot of explorers and we want them all to meet each other and we can't do a whole lot of large in-person events and so we were going to have a bunch of small in-person events which are now going to move online as small group conversations but we also had large not in person Zoom conversations scheduled. And this was already previously scheduled, but we changed our agenda a little bit because with the, with the whole COVID thing, we thought, huh, we really shouldn't just kind of go on our merry way and um, be oblivious to the fact that this is happening. We should, we should consider that people might be feeling, people who are you know, considering embarking on a co-housing project together might be feeling nervous. Um, and we, I, I would say, I would say we found two things. One is, um, which would, was kind of like what Dan said, for the most part, people just want to plow ahead. Like they get it. They, um, they, you know, they know this is a long-term proposition and they figure, you're right, if we're, you know, if we stay on track and we're building in a year and a half and we're, or two years and we're built in three and a half years, um, you know, that things will have bounced back by then. So generally speaking, that's the sentiment that 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 um, that people are uh, they're not that concerned in the long run. Um, the other thing, though, is that what does seem to concern people, um, Zoom seems like an, an excellent platform. You know, it's not perfect, but it'll it it gets us. People are willing. People understand that we need to you know accommodate, and Zoom seems like a pretty good way to to start having gatherings large and small to have the new members get to know each other. Um, so, so what wasn't a problem was the platform and the lack of social connection. What was a problem um, is that the, you know, one of the major uncertainties outside of health right now is economics and people aren't all, um, you know, people who are, who are expecting to have to make a several thousand dollar commitment in the near future with many more thousand dollars following in the months to come. Um, a lot of people still seem to feel like, you know, they were, they were ready for that, but there were a number of people who were 
um, nervous or thinking that this might be putting them past their means or past their, um, the uncertainty of it might be more than they were ready to tackle at this point. So, you know, we're thinking of what, you know, what can we do? We, we hadn't even really figured our, you know, figured out our exact levels of commitment yet financially, but, you know, we're figuring out, well, what can we do to have people make meaningful commitments on the one hand, but respect the economic uncertainty um, on the other hand, and economic uncertainty comes from two places, right? It comes from everybody's stocks or whatever they have losing a lot of value, but it also comes more potently from people who are losing jobs. Yeah. Um, so that that's the bigger hurdle, I think. I don't. I think people are understanding that we can't. You know, I, I think people are adapting well to the social distance. It's the economic uncertainty that's giving. That at least in our group, that seemed to be giving folks more pause. Yeah, makes sense. Karen, this is Shelley. Can I jump in? Yes. Hey, everybody. Um, so, so I um, I'm Shelley Parks, and I'm a member of Skagit Co Housing. It's a building here in Anacortes, Washington, north of Seattle. Um, I also. Um, and a graduate of, of Katie McCammett's 500 Communities Program um, and work a lot with groups um, in their marketing and sales. And so this has been interesting. Um, and, and I think, you know, the thing that I'm, there's a couple of thoughts that have been kicking around my head a lot the last couple of days. Um, one is just the understanding that whenever there is a lot of uncertainty, it's very hard for people to make big decisions. And we're in the midst of that. So just acknowledging that and um, knowing that you know, how do we, you know, we all know that, um, you know, in co-housing, it's not about the buildings, um, it's about community. And of course, you know, all of us who are, are developing our communities, um, you know, oftentimes people want to know, right? What are the floor plans? You know, what is the site plan? You know, they want to know all those things. Um, and it makes it more difficult, right? We can't even do a site tour right now. <laughs> so, you know, if we have land. So, um, so I've been, today I've been thinking a lot about um, what will it look like when we live in community together? And I know that we will have, you know, we, we will have dinners together, we will have game nights, we will have knitting circles, we will have all those things. And I'm finding that people seem to have a little bit more time right now. And they're also just hungry and desperate for connection. So for instance, um, we on Sunday, um, Skagit Co-Housing, we just decided to pull together a knitting circle. We have a lot of us who are knitters and we invited our explorers and also some of our people that had been really interested but hadn't yet made a commitment. And we had 13 people <laughs> together on that and they loved it. And everybody said, we wanna do it again next Sunday. So we're just gonna make it a standing Sunday thing. So, I've just been thinking a lot about how do we show our interested people what community looks like. Um, mm -hmm. And what I learned from that, um, that Zoom call with knitting was it is very different doing a social event on Zoom than it is doing a meeting or a very organized thing. I found, <laughs> I found that I, I do a lot of Zoom meetings and I'm very comfortable facilitating meetings on Zoom. It was very different doing a social event. So I'll just share that with you all if you experience that. Um, I'm sure there are, we'll all get better at it and there'll be some tips, but that's on the top of my head. Shall I? Oh, wait, hold on, Debbie, you're muted. Okay, can you give us some tips on um, doing social meetings? Because that's what we're looking to do. Um, yeah, yeah, well, I wish I could give better tips knowing that I just struggled with it, Debbie, the other day. <laughs> so I just found I, I wasn't prepared for it to be awkward and it felt a little bit awkward, although I talked with some people afterwards and they didn't feel that. And um, so I, I think though what I came away from the one we did is to, if you're, if you're gathering, like for instance, with our knitting group that we put together, we all agreed that having a question to answer next time, you know, some getting to know you question, I think what we're going to do is, because um, a lot of us ended up showing our projects um, just spontaneously, but we thought that would be fun next time to bring something that someone has made us and do a show and tell. 
Um, so it'll need to be a little bit facilitated so that maybe we give people time limits and all that. Because the problem is people tend to talk over each other on Zoom, right? So that's what happened to us a little bit. So trying to figure out how to navigate that. But I was pretty excited about how it went because people loved it, you know, and it was relaxed and it was fun. Um, so does that help, Debbie? I hope it does. I, yes, it does. I'm Debbie Fox from Ralston Creek Co-Housing in Arvada, Colorado. And there are several of our members here tonight. Um, what we've decided to do, although we haven't implemented it yet, but we, we publicized it, is we have monthly community meals, even though we're not living in community. And we invite interested people to come. Plus, it's good for us, too, to get to know each other. Plus, we have um, social events that we organize. So for National Co-Housing Open House Day, we, we did an ice cream social last year. We're going to do another one this year. We're going to do it virtually if we have to. Um, we're going to do a tour of a townhouse at um, Geo's neighborhood, which is where Ralston Creek will be. We're going to do that virtually. So any suggestions, if anybody's done this before, um, would be helpful. That's what we're planning on doing. So I'd like to chime in with a few things. Uh, and then I think Ruth had something to say. Um, so Wild Sage Co-Housing, where I live in Boulder, Colorado, uh, we've done a couple of things. We have, um, uh, to, to kind of address the uncomfortableness, Shelley, we have started a uh, community coffee every morning at 9 a.m., a lunch break at 12.30, and a happy hour at 5.30. And we have a Zoom room, and it's set aside and whoever feels like sh showing up in the Zoom room does. And um, usually I would say there's about four or five people because you know people still, still have lives, though they're very different. Um, but actually what I found has been the, the funnest for me is the time where it's me and one other person and it's a neighbor that, that I know but not really well um, because we don't like have kids the same age or something like that. And, um, and I've found that just like, wow, so how is this for you? Leads to, well, it's okay because my job, blah, blah, blah. And then we end up in this conversation about something that we didn't know about each other, but that doesn't always happen organically. I love the idea of, of, coming with a question or a prompt. The the other thing that you can consider is even if it is a social gathering, you can have a host and the host can do some facilitation. And if there ends up being 30 or four people at your party, your Zoom party, um, hopefully the host has a little tech savvy or has learned it on YouTube right before signing on to <laughs> Zoom and um, knows some little tricks like putting people in breakout rooms. And so instead of this group of, you know, 30 or 40 people that, that um, do sometimes talk over each other, um, which I think Debbie mentioned, um, but people can go into smaller groups to have a little more in-depth conversation. So that's, that's another um, idea as well. Ruth, did you want to chime in with something? Yes, I did. And actually, I should call on Becky. So there are three of us here from Adams Creek Co-Housing, which is a forming community. And Becky, who is here and could speak to this better, but she organized a um, happy hour for us. And there are about 15 of us there. And two things I'll mention, then she can add more. But one was she did serve as the host. And because we've been learning dynamic governance and doing things in rounds, we went around and each took a turn so we really could hear each other. And it was it was really a really lovely hour. So Becky, what else do you want to add? Um, thanks, Ruth. Yeah, I we really enjoyed our happy hour. And so we decided um, after doing one that we would do it every Friday at five o'clock and just have uh, just do a couple of rounds with everybody that attended. And, uh, I, you know, it wasn't awkward. It was, um, 
it was pretty nice and it just gave us a, a little chance to connect. We set the ground rules that we would be positive and just talk about happy things for our happy hour because we have plenty of time to talk about other things. Um, and it, um, it was really nice. And we also invited uh, potential members, people that were interested in our community, um, and uh, they got a chance to meet us and learn a little bit. I'll just make a really quick plug here. Um, thank you, Becky. Um, for uh, somebody, I think maybe it was Shelly that said, well, you can't really do us. Well, maybe it wasn't you. Somebody said something about, well, it's hard to do a site visit. Um, that is true. <laughs> However, what I would um, challenge you to do would be to um, make a video. So Alan and Rains uh, presented some information at, uh, let's see, last Thursday, the 19th, the web chat in this co-housing in the coronavirus series about open houses. So we were trying to get ahead of the game and say, okay, for National Co-Housing Open House Day, which is the end of April, if you choose not to open your houses, so to speak, to people coming in, how can you still how can you share your community? And um, this kind of uh, supports what Shelly was saying. So I had that idea, I'm like, oh, you guys should do, you should do a web chat on this. And Alan, you're a documentarian, is that a word? Filmmaker, document maker. You should do a video. And he's like, yeah, you should too. And I was like, oh, okay. So I was very proud of myself that I went out into my community and I took a little video and, um, I shared it with Alan and he um, didn't respond except for to say he re received it. And I thought, oh, he's, he's busy. Okay, so I learned a whole thing on the web chat that I don't, I, it's like forehead slap. His point was nobody cares about the buildings, right? The co common house is a common house. Yes, your kitchen might have this and this other kitchen has that. And people want to see that, but what we are selling to these potential members and and to gain that forever more enthusiasm that Dan was talking about is um, what co-housing community is, right? It's the it's the secret sauce, as Alan likes to say. So I realized I had to reshoot my entire video because because while I wanted people to see what Wild Sage looks like, what I really wanted to share with them is what an awesome community it is. And so for even for the communities that are forming or building right now, and you, you don't, you, you can't take a tour of the place, you still could create something. Um, you could, so Alan suggested basically staging a tour put some plants in various parts of your common house. So you're walking down the sidewalk and, oh, we have 34 units and 90 people and 30 of them are kids. Oh, look, there's a couple of our kids playing on the playground right now. Hi, kids. Hi. You know, and um, so I learned a lot watching that web chat. And I would highly recommend that if you weren't a part of that web chat or haven't seen the recording, do and think about making um, a video to be able to share with people right now. If somebody reaches out to you through your website or whatever to express interest in your community, to be able to share that video with them. This is Lori. Um, I'm with the Ralston Creek, but I'm an exploring member with my husband who left. Um, <laughs> and I will just say that I think I wouldn't downplay the building thing. For me, it's both. We aren't retired yet. We are just interested in this as a, as a new concept. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm downsizing from a suburb area, coming small. So for me, um, the buildings are a big thing mm -hmm. right now. And community is also big. So for me, I think it's about a 50-50 right now. Now, maybe that changes. 
Um, but I wouldn't downsize the building because I think you draw people in when you can say, yeah, you can have a two bedroom or a common space or whatever we're going to say, mm -hmm. but, but it matters to me because I'm actually selling my family home to go to something that right now has, um, is important. Mm -hmm. Thank you can for I, sharing that. Thank you. Can I jump in? For this is Stu. I'm trying to wait. Is there a, is there a queue here for people to speak? No. Okay. Um, so is it my turn? Sure, go for okay. it. Okay, so I'm Stu and uh, we're a, a building community in the city of West Sacramento, about two blocks from the Sacramento River. We're condos uh, when we build it. And we're in the stage now where we need to add a lot of members uh, so we can qualify for a construction loan. And what I'm curious, what I would be interested in hearing from uh, other groups is, uh, are you taking a break or slowing down or speeding up your mass media? So we're spending a bunch. We we're about to spend, and we were are spending a bunch of money on magazines and newspapers, ads, for example. Um, and now we're in a discussion to decide whether we should hold, slow down a little bit because maybe people are right now aren't very receptive. Uh, to that, but on the other hand, we want to keep kind of keep our name out there and keep our people get used to seeing us. Uh, so I'd be interested in hearing if there's other communities that are having that same dilemma. Uh, we have a limited, we have a marketing budget, but some of the ads are quite expensive. So we don't want to kind of fire that off now and then not have the money in six months when we really, really need to spend a lot more. So, so the question from Stu is whatever it is you're focusing, oh, sorry, you froze. So the question from, from Stu is, um, are you changing your marketing plan at this moment because of circumstances? Especially uh, we, uh, advertisement. We, um, Rawson Creek was just ready to launch a Colorado Public Radio um, for six weeks. We were going to do several spots and we did pull it back. Um, we're ready to go with it when we feel that um, things are calmed down. We just didn't feel that people would, were going to be paying attention to advertising in that respect. So we, we decided to put more focus on the virtual meetings. And um, coincidentally, we have been struggling for several years to get enough members to get a construction loan. And all of a sudden, it just burst. And we're very grateful for that. Um, so we need to keep those people engaged. We have three new Explorer members, which we, I don't think we've ever had three all at one time. So, um, so that's what we decided to do. That was our next big money push was to do Colorado Public Radio advertising, but we have pulled that back. Thank you for sharing. Are there other communities that have, have changed their marketing plan specifically in the paid advertising? Hi, Becky. Yeah, we just had, uh, last night, we had a business meeting, a Zoom chat with uh, Katie McCammond and our developer, Joran Bass, and we talked about the same thing. So we were just ready to do a public radio announcement. And um, also Lou Bowers of PDX Commons was on the call. And um, we all thought, you know, it's, it's just not the right time. It's um, maybe in a couple of weeks, um, it might be a, a more, a better time to do that. But right now, people are very worried and really are focusing on other things and they're not ready to just um, switch their minds over to um, jumping in with some new commit big commitment. I also found that from uh, the contacts from our website, I used to get almost daily contacts from our website and that just dropped off as soon as the virus hit and I've had none at all. So I think it's a time to kind of step back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Anybody else from other forming building communities that want to share? Just a perspective here. What, what, I, what I'm hearing is 
um, step back a little bit from trying to bring in new members who may just be otherwise occupied, but beef up the efforts to create connection and community in the ways that we can with those who are already in the fold, so to speak. I mean, there's a kind of a dichotomy there. I would agree if, if somebody's going through the loss of a job or an illness or their financial situation is a disaster for the next couple of months, buying a new house, as, as exciting as it sounds, may not be their priority. But for those who are in the fold already, there are so many creative ways of keeping them engaged. And just the media itself that we're using, this Zoom thing, that's kind of an extra, wow, you know, what an innovative bunch of people I'm with here to be, who are, who are going to find a way to bring us together in spite of all that's going on. So it seems like a, uh, like a, 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 a really opportune time in many ways, just have to distinguish what, what's really uh, important, what's doable. My name is Tori Baker. I'm from Ralston Creek as well. I'm not sure about whether it's the best time to do a new marketing push, but we had these two new explorers join last week. I spoke to them each on the phone and they were each concerned about the coronavirus because they're worried about what the economics might do, one to the home value and the other is worried about what's going to happen to her family. Maybe they'll want to move into the big house she's in now. I think that's what she's worried about. And what I said to each of them is, well, you've got three months to explore with us and by then you'll know what's going on with the coronavirus and is it going to get worse or is it going to get better and what's it going to do to the economy? So, you know, why not? figure out with us while you're finding out what happens with the virus. And they both thought that was great. Mm -hmm. We're actually relaxing our three months uh, for explorers for the very reason Tori mentioned. That, Stu, I'm curious, have you uh, chosen a, a new time frame or just simply said we're, we're extending it? Uh, Yes, no, I'm not sure. This happened a couple in the last couple of days. Okay, I was just curious. Yeah, and, and Karen, can I go ahead and jump in? This is Shelley, because Stu, I was actually on a conversation with Stu and his group about this, because we, with Skagit Co-Housing, I've been thinking about this a lot, because we have a, the three-month time frame, and we're, um, like Washington Commons, you know, moving towards getting our construction loans. So we're doing a big push to, to get the rest of our members, and of course, now we're facing this. So, you know, I was just, as I was thinking through this, I really thought um, we have a lot of people who have considered becoming explorers, but for whatever reason, you know, just haven't taken that step. And I feel like having the opportunity to call them and let them know that for right now, we don't, we won't, we'll waive that three month time frame and revisit it in a few months, but it would give them a little bit more time. And then it really allows us to really do, you know, more of those community building things virtually, like we talked about. Um, but I would also say that I find um, that this is a really amazing opportunity to work the database, as I would say. You know, so often we get, we get behind in connecting with people that we should be connecting with who have expressed interest at some point. And this is a really great time to really dive into your, your database and, follow up with people maybe that you dropped the ball on at some point, which we've all done that, or, you know, people that have expressed interest in the past and then pulled back. Um, it's, it's just, I would really encourage all of us to do that. They still have an incentive to become a member, uh, which is that they would get to choose their unit because we have floor plans offered now. Uh, so there, it's not like we can just, there's no incentive. It's not like we've killed all the incentive for Explorer to become a member. Uh, but uh, yes to what Shelley said. I'd like to pop in here for a minute. This I'm Pam Kleiss from Quimper Village in Port Townsend, and I'm asking if um, uh, people that are in developing communities have enough of a, a list on your website to enough people that are interested that um, are you putting out newsletters? Are you, are you, doing that once a month or every couple of weeks and just to um to keep people excited about who you are who the individuals are what's happening other than um just keeping the interest about where you are and who you are and just thought i'd put that out there 
Uh, this is I want to answer that and say that not only do we do that, in fact, Debbie does a lot of that, um, but we have a lot of lurkers. I ran into one today. She, <laughs> I ran into her on the, on the trail outside of our neighborhood where we're going to be, and she told me, oh, yeah, I've been following you guys for three years. It's the first time I've ever met her. <laughs> but she says she's been following us for three years. I don't know if she's on our mailing list or not, but she's been following the website. She knew all about us. And I think there's a lot of them. I run into them every now and then. And I don't think we should assume that, um, you know, they won't just show up when the time is right. They seem to show up every now and then. There's a lot of them out there. Um, this is Neil. I'm in Oakland, part of the Swans Market co-housing community and lots of Coho US um, stuff in my last two decades. Um, so I'm, I'm hearing, um, I, I can appreciate the technical and financial um, barriers that we, a lot of us here are kind of respecting in terms of outreach. But there's another part of me, um, which I have learned to listen to uh, which I think at this point with all that is going on in our worlds is longing for more community. I am thinking that if I was looking for a new community, um, one, the folks who are building and creating are, I imagine, going to be speaking from a much more passionate place about the value of community. Uh, and I, I truly believe that those who are curious, and there's thousands of those, are really going to be wanting to feel the sense of what's possible in co-housing. I guess, I guess I'm going to dare to just make a, write a prescription for some of us that I think it's a fantastic time to be doing outreach and to be attracting people either on the trail or in your mailing lists and encourage all of those who are already in your community to do the same. So I know I'm kind of stepping boldly into a prescription writing moment, but I'm also a coach, so I'm giving myself permission to do that. <laughs> anyway, those, those are my words, and it's lovely to see so many of you feel so passionately about what it takes to overcome um, these turbulent times. And I'm gonna go back on mute. I would uh, challenge just a little portion of what you just said, Neil, and it's not that you spoke up at all. You get to do that. Um, you said something about how the, the forming building groups have that, like, that serious passion and energy. And I don't disagree with that, but I will say what I have seen in my community and what I'm hearing from some people in other communities is that their, their excitement is renewed because they're realizing, holy crap, like the sky is falling and I have this community and people are rallying around and going to the grocery store and creating puzzles for the kids and all kinds of things like that. So, so I would say there's, there's some really interesting renewed energy in uh, the old timer communities that's been really fun to see. And uh, just so you know, where I've been seeing a lot of that is on the uh, co-housing Facebook group. So I, the one I saw this morning that I woke up to when I checked Facebook was uh, Jamaica Plain in Boston. Um, at seven in the morning every day, they all step out onto their porches and say good morning to everybody or whoever's awake at that time, I guess. And I was like, wow, that's brilliant. <laughs> Karen, this is Annie Russell. Hi. Hi. Um, I lived in co-housing for 15 years and now I don't. I'm on the call because I'm helping Ralston Creek with their marketing. Um, but I wanted to tell you as somebody who is not in co-housing and, and who is not in co-housing and was, I realize what I'm missing. So I'm underscoring what Karen said as sort of like the void here where I live now wasn't as noticeable 
as it is now. And I was so horrified by how huge the chasm was that I started a listserv. Well, my son helped me start a listserv for the community, which they we had never had here before, which we take so for granted in co-housing. And everybody here was like, oh my God, this is amazing. This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And we just take that as an everyday occurrence. So I do think for people who have been lurking um, and even those, especially those who are explorers, I think they're going to have an experience they haven't had before. This is Lori again from uh, Ralston Creek as an explorer. And I think it would be really helpful from the co-housing US or whatever that we get stories like that. So from a marketing perspective to draw people in for the co-housing, I would love, like, I think one thing that drew me into the Ralston Creek was that they had a video from another organization that said what it was for them. So they couldn't, as Ralston Creek, say that because it's not built yet. But to hear stories of what's working in creating community would be helpful to post to our Facebook page or our, um, to draw people in because there's only so much you can do um, if you have just the starting number of people or for whatever reason, I'm just saying that it, it, it would be helpful to hear those stories like what you just said, Karen, about um, different ways community is serving uh, each other at this point that we can um, draw people in. So Neil had mentioned about how there's lots of energy. It's hard to do that as a new community, but if we could draw and help help us establish a community through experience, it would be incredibly helpful. Yeah. So thank you for, for uh, making that request, I guess. Um, so there is somebody that uh, dabbles in, I don't know, video stuff and is taking a bunch of those little video clips from the Facebook page and putting them together. Um, because there, there are some little stories there, and then they're going to work on um, putting some um, voiceovers and, and some other uh, like interview kind of things in between. Um, so that is coming. I have no idea when that'll be like ready to share, but in the meantime, um, you can uh, point people out to the Facebook group and um, and they'll see some stuff. I'm seeing stuff every day um, to different variabilities, but yeah, that would be good to have a, a one collective thing. I'd like to point out that you know, I've been teaching online for 21 years and there have been several examples here of what is very clear to me as an online teacher, which is that you don't worry about when you teach online, you don't worry about, you know, what's the latest technology and what's different about teaching online and how do I do it online? You just worry about what are good teaching techniques. Mm -hmm. And then you think about, okay, how can I do that online? And there've been several examples of that tonight. How do we get our story out? What's, what's different about co-housing? So Karen, you mentioned, I think it was you, that when you have a party, you gotta have different rooms when it gets to be too big. And somebody else, or maybe this was you, Karen, mentioned that the, at the video, you got to have people in it, not just buildings. Mm -hmm. And just now we talked about stories, Lori said, make it real. Those are all just regular lessons. And mm -hmm. they're all true when we do it virtually. Mm -hmm. So everything we do virtually has the same rules as what we do in general. Mm -hmm. And we just need to remember that. Mm -hmm. Good reminder. Thank you. What other things do people want to share? So I'm wondering, um, Roger touched on this um, a little while ago about the financing and that is you know, for, for those that are 
um, new members or, or explorers and uh, those folks that the, the finances are something that they have to really pay attention to as they're deciding kind of what their level of commitment is or what they're able to do at this point. And I'm wondering if any communities have come up with any uh, particularly unique ways to deal with that. I don't know if this is unique. Uh, this is hard to talk about in a big open group like this. Uh, you know, we're just looking at our cash flow because when we recruit a new, when a new somebody joins our group now, there's cash calls right away. Mm. It's not just their membership, and so one way we can slow that. So we're talk, we're we haven't done anything yet, but we're talking about is there a way we can work with our developer, our architects. Where's the cash going? Can we, is there a way we can slow that down a little bit so that the cash call doesn't come quite so quickly? Uh, especially if we want to, if there's some, if we have an explorer or two who want to join right away uh, and there, there's some risk or uncertainty that we didn't have a few weeks ago. So we're looking at, at ways to slow down the cash call a little bit. So it's not going to decrease there's no way this is going to decrease. And the second thing is uh, we hope to build and we don't think the building costs will go down as a result of this crisis, uh, but maybe this will keep it from going up. There may be a lot, the, the contractors, building contractors may find themselves, it's a little more competitive environment, you know, and whereas a few months ago we would have said, oh my gosh, it's going to, we can't, who can't find somebody who's going to build for us because there's so much building going on, in, at least in California, but I think in many places. So those two things, slow down the cash call a little bit by working with our developer and architect team. And secondly, just being aware that this, this may help us keep control of our prices, uh, our eventual prices, because of building costs not, not going up as much as they might have we have a little delay. I love that, Stu. Thank you for sharing that. That that the the first part of what you said just really got me thinking about. Okay, so thinking outside of the box, right? So asking your developer if they can work with you to decrease costs or to delay costs. Asking the architect, yes, yeah, sure, why not? Right? I think the worst they could do is say no, but. Um, but it's something you can ask. And so it's that thinking outside of the box, like extending your um, Explorer membership beyond three months, or maybe de considering decreasing your membership, or um, I don't know, but it's that outside of the box kind of thinking that I think um, is what will help create some new situations. What else? Anybody, any other communities um, that have put some serious thought to the financial situation um, right now and how they can work with those challenges? Can I raise my hand? I'm invisible because I can't figure out how to get the camera to work. Oh, dang. <laughs> uh, we're at Green Grove Co-Housing in Forest Grove, Oregon, and we've just listed one of our homes uh, on the community land trust model with proud ground. Um, and we are hoping that that will help because it's a permanently affordable model, but our first open house for that home was wiped out by coronavirus. So now it's kind of an opening for anybody anywhere to apply for that home that and then I guess we'll have to go through a virtual membership process but one of the questions I have listening to others is there, there seems to be this kind of benchmark about three months that people are talking about in terms of explorers is that a McCammett and Durrett thing or what is that you're re referencing as sort of a standard uh, to 
Karen, should I jump in and answer yeah, that? Yeah, I was okay. just going to say, hey, Shelly, can you answer that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it, it changes. Um, I think this, so yeah, Katie McCammon, you know, has her model of um, supporting groups with the Explorer. And I think um, it's, it's different for the different phases you were in. For instance, Skagit co-housing, when we first um, started, we, we didn't have a time limit. And then when things got real when we got our land and our architect we did you know decide that we needed a time limit because we needed explorers to to have you know an end date and to move forward so i think it's um if you're if you're you know nimble and working with your uh explorers and moving to membership you're always looking to adjust that and so for instance we're planning on you know, had this not happened, this crazy time that we're in, we probably would have looked to be shortening it um, even less because we're getting closer and closer to construction and needing people to come on board faster. So it's it's about looking at where you're at in the process and your cycle and adjusting the explorer time frame as needed. So is that when you, the time before the first cash call or, you know, what exactly does that mean? The, the explorer period that you would shorten? Um, you know, I, I would actually be happy to talk with you offline about that if you have, because that, that's, there's a lot of nuances to that. So um, I will go ahead and put my phone number in the chat. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to take calls on that. So that is a standard thing for most co-housing communities. I and mean, we, we have a membership process. And we have certain time frames and expectations, but I just didn't know if it was kind of a universal for um, like maybe McCammett and Direct projects to do it. And I would say, I would say Katie McCammett with co-housing solutions. So okay. yeah, so feel free. I'm going to put, I'll put my, uh, my phone number and you're welcome to call me if you'd like to talk about it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Shelley, for making mm -hmm. that offer. Yep. Anything else that anybody would like to share or ask of others about how to attract and engage those new members while we're in this period of the coronavirus? I'll, I'll just um, add something that I've noticed in my own life, which is that in the for the first week or two when it was just n new information and especially in Colorado where we live kind of far away from the epicenters everything was so quiet but every all the organizations I belong to are really ramping up with um, with zoom with online opportunities so my observation is people are going to get busier and busier because they're not just going to be sitting at home waiting so if communities are planning to do advertising or out uh, phone call outreach or uh, zoom events sooner rather than later would be good and that's i think a congratulations to co-housing because um you've really ramped up in a big fat hurry and it's been an advantage thanks annie i'm glad you noticed <laughs> i did yeah finally i'm a little slow <laughs> everybody's talking about how life is slowing down and they get to like do those extra projects at home and i'm just like what <laughs> <laughs> my hours have extended <laughs> right exactly um i'm sharon mccauley from berkeley thank you um, and one of the things uh, we're just had, uh, we currently have four core members, but we have purchased our land. And we have, at the moment, over 70 Explorer households for potentially um, no more than 40 uh, slots available. And so we were in the process of trying to meet each other and vet each other and get everyone online so that we could uh, figure out exactly what we're doing and doing our get it built workshop and everything. And um, one of the things is we had a meeting on Sunday uh, 
And it was actually a pre-scheduled Zoom meeting uh, because we've decided that in our process, we were going to do several live meetings, some bigger, some smaller, and then a Zoom meeting every month in the three months um, before we were going to try and have everybody become core members. And uh, we were very pleasantly surprised that the attitude of the 40 households that joined our Zoom meeting mm -hmm. um, in general were very positive and very excited about wow if we're in a co-housing situation you know how we can support each other and how we can do better things for each other there were obviously people that were concerned financially but in general it was very uplifting and exciting to us because we really didn't know how it was going to play out and we thought it was a very positive situation thank you that's fantastic 40 people yay <laughs> incredible <laughs> that's great i think we have time for one more and and becky i saw you raising your hand a little bit ago yeah i just thought i would share um some of what i thought was wise advice from katie last night and she said um while she didn't um think it was really time for maybe not time for a radio ad quite yet the the number one thing that she advised was don't go quiet don't go quiet you've got to keep in touch with your community and um so we took that to heart and we had a marketing meeting this morning and decided to have every sunday to have a zoom open house every sunday and um just see um just to just to keep that open and then that'll give us a chance for our members to communicate if it's just members or um, outreach to across the country. Thank you. What is your group, Becky? Adams Creek Co-Housing in Hood River, Oregon. Becky, thank you for sharing that. And um, I think that is an excellent segue to wrap up to not go quiet whether you're the forming building community or the existing communities like don't go quiet we should be out on our porches singing to each other every night or every morning or whatever right <laughs> that's what it's about and the nice houses um but uh really yeah keep reaching out to people and staying in contact with people um so next week's web chat is on so tuesday no wait today's the 24th tuesday the 31st same time same place um joran from uh he's the senior development manager for udp the urban development partners uh based out of portland and um so he's going to be talking um let me just look at his little description here he's going to be talking about steps that forming communities can take to keep on track with the development process while managing equity reserves and looking at how communities can optimize their position coming out of the current slowdown. Um, so he's going to be presenting some information and then there will be time for questions uh, for him and conversation for whomever um, is on the web chat. So I would just like to thank everybody for being here tonight and sharing what they've experienced or what their uh, plans are for shifting things a little bit. And thank you for some great advice for a few of you that have been around the block a little while. Um, let's see, what else was I going to say? <laughs> Karen, oh, anything? Karen, yeah. Do, this is Ruth. Do we, re do we register for each one individually? Nope, nope, just the one. We asked that people register so that we could be able to, um, at the point that this series is no longer needed, we can send an email out to all of the people to say, hey, don't forget, you can see the recordings, you've already registered, it's free. Um, please tell all your friends and neighbors to join us. Um, so our intention is, is to do these web chats once or twice a week as long as they're needed. Thank and you. if there's something in particular that you would like to see as a topic, 
or uh, somebody for for conversation like tonight or um, a topic for somebody to present information, please let us know. Um, I think, Neil, can you just, uh, I can't multitask at the end of the day. Can you uh, type in my email address to the chat? <laughs> um, welcome. You're welcome. Either that or you have to wait till I'm done talking and then I'll do it. <laughs> but uh, you're welcome to email me with, um, with any of those suggestions. And I just want to say, Annie, thank you for, for recognizing, yes, we here at Coho US have really, um, I feel like we really kind of stepped up to the plate with this situation. And um, our huge goal was to be able to um, connect the larger co-housing community and to be able to use those, you know, those resources and relationships that we talk about within our own, you know, the smaller communities, but to be able to do that uh, nationwide. Um, it does take resources. Uh, we're always happy to accept donations. And um, I think Neil was going to plug that into the chat too. Thank you, Neil, for being my uh, wingman tonight. Um, and uh, check out our website. There's all kinds of other information on there as well. And in fact, um, let's see, what was your, hold on. Uh, Oh, where'd she go? Um, there's, uh, there are some of those stories about co-housing. Somebody was mentioning that um, that can be shared and some of that is on the website as well. So I think that's about it. Thank you all so much for being here. I hope that was useful, helpful, and you feel connected. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks yeah. a lot, Karen. Thank you very much. Karen.